speakers tonight are Bofer Chan, Alex Chow, and Zoe Zhao. As you can probably read, <laughs> Bofer Chan is a writer, editor, and member of the Laosan Collective, who was previously a journalist working in Hong Kong. Alex Cho is a PhD student in geography at UC Berkeley, previously a student activist in Hong Kong. He was sentenced to prison for seven months for his political participation in the 2014 Umbrella Movement. Zoe Zhao is a sociology PhD student doing research at trans uh, on transnational social movements and digital labor in China. And the illustration is made by a Laosan member, Sonia, who's also manning the laptop tonight. So both friends, Alex and Zoe will each hear the presentation. The total presentation time will be about an hour, and then we'll open up to the floor for conversation. My name is Connie, and then we'll be moderating the discussion afterwards. Because we started a little late, we're hoping to wrap up the event at 9.45. All right, so without further ado, I'll turn it to both friends. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, so thank you so much, Connie, for the introduction. Uh, thank you to Verso. Thank you, Duncan, um, for making this event happen. Thank you to everyone who's come out. This is uh, a great crowd. And i um, really excited to be discussing uh, this topic with everyone tonight. Um, as Connie said, uh, my name is Wilfred. I am a member, a writer um, of Laosan Collective. Uh, we formed in 2019 in response to the ongoing uh, protest movement in Hong Kong uh, to provide critical uh, uh, left perspectives on Hong Kong, uh, especially when we looked at uh, the discourse uh, in the West about Hong Kong, we felt that there were a lot of contributions that we wanted to make. So, um, you know, I'll be sharing a little bit of that tonight. And, um, you know, my background is as a journalist. I lived in Hong Kong for uh, four years uh, after graduating from college, and I worked at CNN International, uh, where I reported on the Umbrella Movement um, and its aftermath. Um, and since then, I've been working as an independent writer, uh, editor, um, and uh, right now I'm uh, doing Laosan basically full time. Uh, so uh, this is uh, really exciting for me. And um, it's also a huge honor uh, to be uh, sitting next to Alex Chow, um, and I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, thanks, Wilfred, for uh, introducing the event and introducing himself. Um, I met Wilfred just three weeks ago when I uh, came from the West Coast. So actually, um, this is the first time we are collaborating. But we met, when, when we met, we felt like we shared a lot of like intellectual curiosity and a lot, con a lot of similar concern on Hong Kong. And that's why we come up with an idea like that, like let's do an event together. And that's why we have the sharing panel here tonight. And I'm really excited to be in conversation with Wilfred, Zoe, and folks here, uh, because uh, we have like, well, spent like weeks in coming up with the ideas on like how to tell a story about Hong Kong so we could facilitate and advance our understanding and discussion about the ongoing movement in Hong Kong. So I really look forward to it, and I really thank everyone who spent your time here tonight with us. Really thank you so much. And I also pass it to Zoe and let her introduce herself and her work to you. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you, Wilfred, and thank you, Lawson, for inviting me to this talk. So uh, I knew Lawson partly by Twitter, and uh, last year during the uh, Hong Kong protests when I'm experiencing some sort of like political repression, of depression, and uh, and I'm glad that I can know this community because it offers a left wing and a perspective which is rarely seen in the uh, in this era of the like the new Cold War. So uh, I hope uh, really excited that we we can make this event today and also uh, I. I studied in Hong Kong from 2004 to 2015 when I finished my master's degree there and when I got a chance to learn a lot of social movement stuff and I joined Umbrella Movement where Alex was a student leader at that time. So I got interested in uh, transnational movement. Uh, then it became my research question and my motivation to enter my PhD degree in UPenn in the US. 
So uh, today I will kindly talk about the transnational uh, diffusion and the transnational effect of the Hong Kong protest. Please do. Thank you. Um, so I guess I'll start with my presentation. So in the last few months, <clears throat> we've all seen images of Hong Kong in the news, and by now they should be quite familiar. You see a massive river of protesters in the street. You see young people dressed in all black, charging through clouds of tear gas. And of course, the occasional American flags. <laughs> <laughs> and if you've read further, then maybe you've heard of the protesters' five demands. That is a full withdrawal of the extradition bill, uh, an independent inquiry into police violence, dropping the characterization of protests as riots, uh, releasing uh, all detained protesters, and full universal suffrage. And protesters have actually stayed very disciplined about sticking to these five demands. Um, yet these demands, on their face, also fail to capture the depth and uh, the subtleties of Hong Kong's structural inequality, or point to the histories that have created it. I think that if you do hear Hong Kong being analyzed, uh, it's often framed as a contest uh, between stark binaries, uh, both in China, where state media portrays the movement as a separatist movement that betrays China's anti-imperialist project, and in the West, where US politicians have a desire to frame uh, this movement as a contest between freedom and authoritarianism, East versus West, some sort of validation of the West's own supposed virtues. And of course, these reductive portrayals are intentional because they hide the way that both of these states are in fact complicit in Hong Kong's ongoing difficulty. And the thing is, it can be difficult to explain Hong Kong, the idea of it, even for Hong Kongers, because the idea of the Hong Konger is a recent invention. Our relationship to China is quite complex. The vast majority of Hong Kong's Han Chinese people, including my direct ancestors, first came to the city as immigrants or refugees from the mainland. Many of them uh, were hoping to escape from violence and poverty. Uh, this is my grandfather um, who uh, came to Hong Kong um, uh, from a, a part of Guangdong. And uh, people like him didn't view the um, you know, colonial era Hong Kong as a place that really belonged to them. Their ties to China remained strong, but neither were they passive subjects. And from the very beginning of British colonization, Hong Kong people led protests and strikes. And it was actually a series of violent anti-colonial uprisings in 1967, uh, inspired by Mao's Cultural Revolution, which finally compelled the Hong Kong government to introduce social reforms like public housing, public education, public health care, public transit, and the current protests are just the latest evolution in this long tradition of dissent. In fact, the same martial law that the British colonial government used to quell the protests in 1967 is the same law being used on protesters today. But these moments of agency also don't mean that Hong Kong people have ever enjoyed meaningful self-determination in the sense of being able to determine our own political futures. And the truth is that every twist and turn of our history has been overdetermined by the desires of these empires that encircle us. These empires have not only shaped Hong Kong's geography, uh, politics, and economy, but how knowledge about Hong Kong is itself produced and transmitted. So to that end, our project, um, ongoing and here tonight, is to tell a more complete story about Hong Kong by situating it between these historical forces of empire and capital, to help understand how political resistance in Hong Kong contends with these tremendous systems of power. When we talk about empire and capital in Hong Kong, I think a helpful frame of reference is the coloniality of power, a concept originated by decolonial thinker Anibal Quijano, which is about the racial and economic hierarchies created by the Euro-American colonial order and the contradictions that colonizers introduce in order to divide and rule, 
and how they don't simply vanish when the colonizer leaves. But his key point, really, was that colonization restructures thought itself. So how you understand yourself, how you understand uh, each other, uh, your relationship to the land, your notions of what is good, what is bad, all of these have been fundamentally altered. And the idea of coloniality means it becomes difficult to rely on Western analytical categories to think about Hong Kong. What does this idea of nation mean for us? What about autonomy, democracy, freedom, sovereignty? When we never had political agency, what does it mean to speak of left and right? It can be difficult, I think, for outsiders to imagine the sense of emptiness and even despair that Hong Kongers face over having no history that we can truly claim as our own, and yet seemingly no viable models for a self-determining future. And in Hong Kong's case, coloniality speaks to the way Hong Kong has always been shaped by and for the benefit of faraway elites. And despite the lowering of the Union Jack and the raising of the Chinese flag, and the replacing of a white British ruler with a Han Chinese one. These structures of power have remained the same and in many cases have intensified at the direction of the Chinese leadership in collusion with Western power. But it also speaks to the way Hong Kong has been roped into a centuries old system of global exploitation, not simply as a victim, but also as an intermediary and as a collaborator. In 1984, the UK and China signed an agreement, the Sino-British Joint Declaration, which laid forth the plan for Hong Kong's future. This plan was finalized without any input from Hong Kong people, and it could not be more explicit about its goals. Private property, ownership of enterprises, legitimate right of inheritance, and foreign investment will be protected by law. The Hong Kong Special Administrative Region will retain the status of an international financial center, and its markets for foreign exchange, Gold, securities, and futures will continue. There will be free flow of capital. <coughs> the consequence is that since Hong Kong was handed over to Chinese rule in 1997, inequality in this so-called special administrative region has only increased. Its Gini coefficient, which is a measure of income inequality, is only second in the world's cities after New York. <laughs> it is a consequence of a deep fiscal conservatism Hong Kong has one of the world's lowest corporate taxes and it has zero capital, uh, capital gains tax, which is an absolute dream for capitalists. Instead, the Hong Kong government raises the bulk of its money through private land sales. Uh, it hoards the supply of land and colludes with Beijing-friendly real estate tycoons to keep prices high, which for the government means big premiums. And for ordinary people, uh, a city with the highest rents in the world where university graduates must save decades just to afford a down payment, where one in five residents live under the poverty line in literal cages that look a lot like this one. As Hong Kong left-wing leader uh, Avery Ng told me, uh, we are ground zero for the damage that neoliberalism can do. But under Chinese rule, Hong Kong's government has also doubled down on colonial uh, border logics. Um, and that means barring Southeast Asian migrant domestic workers from getting permanent residency, using its police force to harass anyone whose skin is darker than mine, often detaining them in atrocious conditions, uh, potentially indefinitely. Uh, Hong Kong rejects 99.4% of asylum and refugee cases, including this man and child who I interviewed in 2013. The ideology of colonial capital is why Hong Kong's governance has been structured since British colonialism to give the illusion of popular participation with no actual control given to its people. And a great example is Hong Kong's legislature, where half the seats are elected by industry insiders like finance, tourism, sports, taking this idea of corporate personhood to an uh, absurd level. Think uh, Citizens United on steroids. This legislature has no power to propose its own legislation and can be disbanded at any time by the city's leader, who is called the chief executive without a single hint of irony. And of course, this leader is handpicked by a tiny closed door committee that has always been stacked full of Beijing's corporate loyalists, all but ensuring that the city's policies will always favor the rich and powerful. And this tortured afterlife of colonialism 
is evident in Hong Kong's paradoxical global status, in which it has the appearance of a sovereign state, such as its own currency, immigration system, legal system, but none of the autonomy. And this, of course, is by design. Hong Kong's so-called special characteristics were intentionally preserved for a period of 50 years in the joint declaration. It allows Hong Kong to serve as an interface uh, between Western and Chinese capital, a kind of geopolitical loophole uh, that China and Western powers use to get around their own nationalistic foreign policies. This special status is further reinforced by the US government's own Hong Kong Policy Act of 1992, authored by Mitch McConnell, <laughs> which means that the US treats Hong Kong as a separate entity for the purposes of trade and investment. And all of this is why, even today, both US and Chinese firms depend on Hong Kong intermediaries to help get around Trump's tariffs on Chinese products. It's why Hong Kong is China's number one target for outbound direct investment to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars a, a year. And why the US trade surplus with Hong Kong is actually the single largest out of any of America's trading partners. It's why Chinese tech giant Alibaba chose the Hong Kong Stock Exchange to hold the world's largest IPO of 2019 uh, just six weeks ago, uh, even as protests were raging outside on the streets. And for nearly two centuries now, this arrangement has remained stable, precisely because Hong Kong people have not only been shut out from determining our own society, but we've been taught to tolerate these larger structures that keep us unfree. And it's why, despite these now seven months of protests, the Chinese government simply shrugs its shoulders confident that its long cultivated relationships with Hong Kong's tycoons will carry the day. It's why the United States so-called Human Rights and Democracy Act is nothing more than a PR stunt. Its centerpiece is an empty threat to revoke the US's own special treatment of Hong Kong, which is something that it certainly would almost never do. We need to realize that for all of China's rhetoric about anti-imperialism or the United States rhetoric about democracy, Neither of these powers is actually interested in changing Hong Kong's status quo as a subservient cog in the system of global capitalism. China's new top official in Hong Kong, Luo Heining, summed it up last week. Everyone eagerly hopes Hong Kong can return to the right path, is what he said. Or as Donald Trump put it, the protests are riots and China could stop them if they wanted. This explains why so many Hong Kong protesters have a slogan, Die Hong Kong Sie Gei Gao which means we alone can save our Hong Kong. But maybe the hardest question of all is what exactly we're trying to save. There are no real answers we can pull out from our past. I think it means we must come to terms with this deep disillusionment, that none of the heady promises of the great 20th century ideologies, Chinese communism, Western liberalism, third world self-determination, have ever actually had Hong Kong people in mind. Without coming to terms with this loneliness, it becomes tempting to indulge in resentment and insularity. It explains why some Hong Kongers have turned to nativism or colonial nostalgia or appeals to Donald Trump. Why others have simply given up on Hong Kong altogether. But I think for the rest of us, this emptiness is also an opportunity because as we struggle in different ways to disentangle ourselves from empire and capital, we are forced to invent a new praxis one that doesn't get to be simple. To take Hong Kong as a starting point, for those of us on the left, means recognizing how states are the shepherds of capital, that these ideas of democracy and sovereignty are them by themselves not enough, that for real emancipation, we need to demand a world system that does not equate our dignity with having a border. It means undoing our own city's role in the dispossession of migrants, refugees, workers in and from the global south. And it means we have to find a way to bring these ideas onto the streets. And even after this mobilization ends, to find a way to live on unglamorously within a kind of tension that will never truly go away. Because as difficult as it is, this emptiness is ultimately an invitation to write a new history. And so being here tonight, speaking with Alex and Zoe and all of you, uh, I want to extend that invitation to all of us to keep doing this work and figure it out together. And it really is an honor, so thank you.
So really, thanks Wilbert for his excellent theoretical insight about how Hong Kong could serve as a practice to change. And also, you would tell us the labor movement connection between Hong Kong and China, and the emergence of the international right in Hong Kong. My goal is to provide folks some ways to understand the energy, enthusiasm, frustration, fear, anxiety, and aspiration of the resistance in Hong Kong. I want to share some stories of how people have responded to difficult crossroads in our history, from the Second World War until now. To understand the complex emotion in the struggle, we could start our journey with some basic questions. Who are these Hong Kong people? What do they want after the Japanese and the British rulers, not to mention war, destroyed most of their families, life, home, neighborhood, and achievements? How did the colonial era shape people's imagination, aspiration, vision, and skills in the struggle for a better future? Since the colonial period, people have tried a lot, felt a lot, and learned a lot. I hope to present you a lively story of our resistance, not by judging, but by first understanding our struggle, so we could better capture the challenges, dilemma, options, and opportunities facing us. More than a left-right analytical framework, debates on praxis, or the theory and practice of social change help us understand the core of the complex politics in Hong Kong. People disagree on how to create Hong Kong's future. By debating the Brexit, people are competing for different tools to force a change. No matter what generation they belong, a common theme is that we are all against the gloomy reality shaped by the colonial and post-colonial legacy. In this disagreement are, broadly speaking, four characters in Hong Kong politics. Direct action, social movement, electoral strategy, and student activism. Because of the peculiar colonial politics in Hong Kong, student activism plays an important role and often enjoys some credi more credibility than other activists or politicians. And I'm part of this legacy. Student movement have a strong presence in Hong Kong because the student union in Hong Kong are regarded as a critical and progressive voice towards social policy. And different unions would band together to form the Hong Kong Federation of Students, which play a critical role in the development of Hong Kong's resistance. You will see this praxis coming up in the stories I'm going to tell next. Sometimes one strategy dominates, Sometimes they compete or collaborate because people feel the need to do so. In the worst case scenario, people attack one another without gaining more credibility or trust from the majority. But they are all part of the Hong Kong struggle. People debate questions of praxis, leader versus leaderness, institutional versus grassroots, trust and credibility, these are really questions of equality, liberty, humanity, and dignity. The tensions among themselves and the practices to achieve them. All of this is made very difficult by the empire and capital in Hong Kong. Empire and capital seek to interrupt and co-opt these debates at every generation of Hong Kong's political history. These dynamics are experienced as political emotions and these emotions affect what strategies Hong Kong people choose, and these strategies in turn create more complex emotions that open up and limit the resistance in Hong Kong. When we reveal the past, tragedy is always a common theme in our history. Wartime is no doubt tragic, and the end of the Second World War only means the start of the Civil War in China between Mao's Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, and the nationalist Kuomintang. Many immigrants flocked to Hong Kong to escape the conflict. For many of them, Hong Kong was not home, but a transitional hub, a midpoint for the next generation, for the next destination in life. 
The situation lasted for several decades. People were in a state of trust. In the 1960s, the future was still uncertain. Some supporters of the CCP projected hope and excitement as they shared the sentiment of the Cultural Revolution in China. By the 1950s and 1960s, many labor strikes took place in Hong Kong because of poor labor protection law. People are not really satisfied about life, but they also fear what happened in China, yet have no resources to leave Hong Kong. During the Cultural Revolution, the local CCP leaders decided to take a more explicit pro-China direct action, mobilizing people to attack the police during a labor strike. The British government fought back, and dozens of people on both were killed. The militant confrontation, combining CCP's political infighting, anti-colonial sentiment, and labor struggle, threatened the colonial regime. People could cast a time in the light of third world liberation, but the leftists in Hong Kong lost trust from the public when they started to plant bombs in public areas in Hong Kong. Hong Kong people began to doubt how pure and progressive the resistance was when it invoked the power struggle of the CCP. People, including many youngsters, did not turn left as the world did. The left, instead, is stigmatized with the violent CCP. By the 1970s, a radical transformation was on its way. The colonial officials assessed and realized that if the Chinese government wanted to take back Hong Kong with force, they had little chance in defending Hong Kong. Instead, they foresaw that the Chinese government might negotiate Hong Kong's sovereignty someday in the future. To gain more leverage, the colonial government began to provide more social services to Hong Kong people, expanding the provision of public education, public housing, and infrastructures. For students, they were divided into two groups. The pro-CCP nationalists who supported whatever the CCP said, and the social reformers who advocated local reform to transform Hong Kong and China. The division did not last long because the pro-CCP nationalist fashion collapsed after Chairman Mao passed away, and the gain of four was dismantled. The socialist dream ran out of steam, and supporters turned disillusioned and disorganized. A friend of mine, who was an underground CCP member and a student union representative in the 1970s, recorded that when Mao passed away, the CCP secret agents, who have been organizing her and others on local campaign, simply lose contact with her, reflecting the political chaos of the time. While people had no political means to change any policy, the 1970s also witnessed economic boom in Hong Kong, which many youngsters born after the Second World War turned themselves into professional workers in Hong Kong. Economic aspiration and a class ladder were within reach. There's a glimpse of optimism in Hong Kong, but also politi political confusion about the future. The colonial government was implementing many social welfare programs, and many students turned social activists would organize civil groups to apply pressure to the colonial government for better welfare. The British would even appoint activists into different consultation committees which was a strategy of co-opting, as well as a political opportunity presented to many activists. The 1980s came with many shocks. The shocks, people experienced hope, anxiety, fear, and terror in this decade. On the one hand, economic prosperity gave people hope because countless investment opportunities in manufacturing sectors presented to people in Hong Kong and China. On the other hand, the hope is fragile. When the foundation was swayed, people turned cynical and anxious. Many Hong Kong people are caught surprised in 1982 when the British Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, met with the Chinese leader, Deng Xiaoping, who discussed the future of Hong Kong. The 99-year list, which was signed 
by the previous Chinese Empire and the British government in the 19th century would expire in 1997, soon. When the official meeting turned public, people were anxious. Would the British leave Hong Kong? Would Hong Kong be handed back to the CCP? Would private property be guaranteed? Or would Camus, cultural revolution, and bloody infight strike Hong Kong? There are many questions, but only a few answers. The majority of the Hong Kong people were excluded to take part in answering this political question facing them. Some political elites, who were student activists in the 1960s and 70s, started to organize themselves and assert the need for people to take part in a negotiation. However, within two years, in 1984, the British and Chinese government said they had reached an agreement, calling it the Sino-British Joint Declaration. Hong Kong would be returned to China in 1997 and would adopt a framework called One Country, Two Systems. The British government started to consult the people on political reform, introducing Hong Kong to electoral democracy, while the Chinese government set up two committees to draft the constitution of Hong Kong, inviting many business, professional elites, and students into the committee. When the two regimes made a deal, the students and social activists felt like they could only perfect the framework, ensuring the economic prosperity while advocating the electoral reform. By the time, the framing of communism versus capitalism was collapsing. The socialist stream was in transition to a capitalist world. The only visible and attractive alternative presented to the people in Hong Kong was capitalism. Not to mention that the Chinese government was also creating a capitalist market and giving up the planted economy. Even the university students who wrote to the Chinese premier, Zhao Ziyang, for democracy, got a reply letter. In the letter, Zhao, the Chinese premier, said that ruling Hong Kong with democracy was a no-brainer. The future is uncertain, but electoral politics guaranteed hope. All the illusions and dreams were smashed and crumbled in 1989, when the Tiananmen massacre took place in Beijing cracking the democracy movement in China. From 1989 to 1997, 500,000 people emigrated from Hong Kong to elsewhere. The glimpse of hope turned it into the politics of fear. Would the CCP collapse in a few years? Or would Hong Kong crumble after 1997? People could not see a future. Many left. Some people even observed that the art in Hong Kong enter the zeitgeist of postmodernism. If you review the film and Canton Hall during that period, many artworks presented a sentiment of life without meaning, purpose, and a future. To many people, the death of Hong Kong was no doubt coming. After the Chinese government lost all legitimacy, and the 1989 social movement proved fertile, the British, which was on the way to retreat, created the political opportunity for activists by opening up election in the legislature. The crackdown of the movement and the emerging election further weakened social movement because of the promise of the electoral strategy facing the anxious and despair people. The activists split among themselves. While some students and social activists turned professional ran for election, some opted for organizing work and social movement. However, the old left movement faced a dead end because Hong Kong was undergoing an economic restructuring which many factories were relocated to China. After 1997, the government rejected the call to endorse the right of collective bargaining. The activists could not muster enough power to resist. When socialist hope had vanished in the 1990s, electoral politics appeared to be the only viable option. Without electoral democracy, Hong Kong people could not save themselves from the empires. Mid-2000s was the turning point. A new generation of young Hong Kongers were rethinking the identity and meaning of Hong Kong in the post-colonial era. 
China taking back Hong Kong has become a reality, and people have nowhere to go except the place they call home, Hong Kong. At the same time, the local government began a new campaign to eliminate all physical but not cultural British colonial traces in the city. At this historical juncture, the youth were skeptical about electoral politics because they saw many infighting of political parties causing the gradual loss of credibility of the pan-democratic camp in Hong Kong. The government allowed it only half of the seats to be directly elected by 4.2 million registered voters and half of the seats to be elected by 200,000 people. The whole design encouraged political parties to compete with one another, a strategy for government to divide and rule, to weaken the oppositional camp. Seeing the political drama in electoral politics, the new young activists participated in many direct actions, such as occupying Star Ferry Pier, Pier a historical heritage about to be abolished. They also mobilized the public to rally against the National Express Railway project in Hong Kong, urging people to rethink land, rural, and urban politics. Whether bulldozing all the old buildings and communities was the option for the city, or did the people have a choice? The emergence of a new direct action activism marked the birth of a new kind of resistance against capital investment fighting for local causes. Their alternative development proposal and effort in direct action and social movement, however, was rejected by the legislature, which was controlled by the pro-Beijing political party. The rising aspiration encountered setbacks. People start to wonder whether nonviolent peaceful movement had any use in Hong Kong. If the legislature and the chief executive election were tightly controlled by the CCP. In the 2010s, people started to lose patience and got mad at each other. In 2010, the moderate leaders in Beijing responded to Hong Kong people's demand, proposing a transitional reform to create universal suffrage. The reform proposal created a split and caused more infighting between the radical and the moderate camps in Hong Kong. The moderate political activists emerged in the 1980s and 1990s opted for a compromise for a pro-Beijing political reform, while the left-leaning parties and young activists emerged in the 2000s insisted on a more radical democratic reform for further economic equality. People not only held different socioeconomic regions, but also disagreed on strategy. The radical launched a de facto referendum, mobilizing people to cast a protest vote as a strategy, while the moderate met with the Chinese officials to discuss the details of the reform package. With the support of the moderate Democrats, the reform package was passed in the legislature, more infighting in the 2012 election, and ordinary people started to lose patience to political parties. In 2012, when people feared that the local government would be revising the curriculum in the middle school, injecting more CCP-style nationalist education to students, the public put hold on middle school students to lead the social movement. Students, like their predecessors in the 1970s and 80s, became a credible driving force of social change. Joshua Wong, now a public face of the Hong Kong youth, and merged in this movement. In 2013, about the time to negotiate with the Beijing government on the political reform package, many people realized a divided camp could not exert enough pressure to Beijing. Two credible scholars and a press tried to heal the divide and launched a campaign, Occupy Central with Love and Peace, to build allies among the left-leaning radical and moderate wing in Hong Kong. The three leaders came up with an idea of referendum, inviting each camp to submit a reform proposal and asking people to vote on which demand to submit to Beijing. If Beijing did not respond, then they would peacefully occupy the streets of downtown Hong Kong. People, youngsters and middle-aged folks, 
turned impatient when the whole campaign had to be last for a year and a half. Was it just a show to Beijing? People wondered. The tension built pressure, and radical students pushed for more radical direct action. I was one of the students by the time, the spokesperson of the Hong Kong Federation of Students. Regardless of the debate, Beijing rejected all the proposals and counter-proposed a reform, essentially allowing Hong Kong people vote for their leaders as long as China approved the candidates. I can still recall the date, the last day of August in 2014. I watched the live TV broadcast, asking myself, who are these Chinese officials in Beijing? I've never authorized to represent me, my friends, and my family. Who on earth has given them the authority and power to decide how to run the city, to decide who is the winner and who is the loser? Some other students pointed the middle finger to the television. I followed. The failure of the campaign was huge frustration. The emotion affected the politics before and during the umbrella movement, causing the movement's divide and tension. Students launched a strike in September of 2014, thinking that if students did not rise up, no one in the city would rise up, given the tragedy we saw in the past decade. In the last day of the strike, we decided to make a moral appeal climbing over the fence and occupying a public square outside the government headquarters. We felt only by sacrificing the public would feel the need, anger, and courage to rise up. We were arrested. More people came to the street, blocking traffic and causing the police to use tear gas. The umbrella movement began. By elimination, the students were the most trust trustworthy groups compared to the politicians the occupied campaign leaders and grassroots organizers. The kind of trust, however, was fragile because the occupiers were divided. Half of them wanted leaders, half of them wanted no leaders. Some of them supported the tactic of community building during the occupy, while some opted for militant confrontation with the police and the authority. When students turned into the most trustworthy leader, we also became more moderate because we had to balance all the ideas proposed by the moderate and radical politicians, grassroots organizers, and the diverse voice of the occupiers while responding to the critiques from the pro-Beijing camp. Students bore the biggest political and emotional burden. And in the beginning of the movement, the students already lost trust to some militant radical. Soon after the police used tear gas, the people heard that the rumor of police would use bullets next to hit the protesters, which reminded Hong Kong people the bloody scene in 1989, the Beijing Tiananmen Massacre. The students, the moderate, and the grassroots organizers feared and announced a strategic retreat. Everyone was terrified, burdened by the collective memory built into the DNA of the city's resistance. The moderate asked the students to offer a negotiation with the government. We did, with no luck for concrete achievement. At the time, the militant wing in Mong Kok, one of the three occupied sites, grew frustrated with the big stage, referring to the big stage as the vertical leadership that did not take their voice into account. The militant rejected the movement's decision-making structure and wanted a lead in this movement. A key online opinion leader of this camp would even ask his supporters to attack the students in Mong Kok. When I stepped into the Mong Kok Occupy site in October 2014, I was soon surrounded by people having no trust in me and others, facing hostile treatment, hearing polemical criticism. These conflicts were not resolved by the end of the movement when the sites were cleared by the police. People were divided, filled it with hatred, resentment, frustration, and sadness. These emotions only turned into a new type of politics. After the 2014 umbrella movement, we witnessed only more infighting between the four practices in Hong Kong's politics. It was common to see people attacking one another as infiltrators, a colonial legacy that people were alert 
of sabotage from the British or the CCP. The politics of trust is fragile. People opted for different practices out of desperation. For direct action, a group of young people formed a pro-independence party and used militant strategy tactics to confront the police during a New Year festival in 2016. When the police wanted to clear the hawkers, the protesters wanted to protect them. The clash escalated, and many people were jailed for three to seven years. For people who opted for electoral politics, they ran for office in the legislature. Both the pro-self-determination self 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 pro self leaders who emerged from the left-leaning movement and the pro-Hong Kong independence advocates who emerged after the umbrella movement out of desperation won the election. Six of them, however, were disqualified by the government with the backing of the court. People also lost trust in the legal system, which was once seen as the shield to ensure capitalism in a post-handover era. For social movement activists, they were weak, and left-wing activists encountered intense criticism from people who see them as not militant enough in direct action during the umbrella movement. Some of them took the electoral route. For students, they were also discredited. Not only was the Hong Kong Federation of Students nearly dismantled, many members faced charges and were jailed. I was one of them. In 2016, when a bookseller who published books critical of the CCP was abduct, ab, abduct, 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 abducted to mainland China, people had a feeling that Hong Kong was dead. In the next few years, the government-controlled legislature passed numerous laws that introduced more socio-economic policy favoring the Hong Kong and Chinese capital to invest in mega infrastructures and land development. People were desperate and thought to emigrate to elsewhere. In 2019, it is total despair. When the officials said they are going to introduce the extradition bill, many youngsters saw it as the last straw to break Hong Kong. The youth confronted the police and blocked the entrance of the legislature. Some even broke into the building, attempting to occupy the chamber. People feel that they have nothing to lose. All major practices, direct elections, social movements, student activism, and electoral politics are blocked in their own way. And all of them have come together in the anti-extradition law movement, foregrounding new emerging practices. In the current movement, the slogan of Be Water signifies fluidity and tolerance. Protesters advocate a consensus of no criticize, no split, and leading this movement. Although people want no formal leaders and formal structure, people show a strong grassroots and online organizing enthusiasm. The 2014 leaders play a very small role in the movement. But many of them, in the last five years, have been working behind the scenes to try to collaborate and heal the rift of 2014. The new political opportunity, along with the reflection on practice and complex emotion, created a, moment, uh, created a momentary space that seems to be, in some way, free of these colonial structures. But it is also very unstable and fragile, and in other ways, fail to predict some other problems. No criticism also creates its own rigidity. At times, people are not sure how to make decisions and deal with moral dynamics. If you, condemn, if you condemn the police, would you condemn the protesters? When you condemn the protesters, would you break the already fragile trust and repeat what has happened in the previous movements? A kind of vicious infight. If you don't criticize publicly, what is your moral and ideological grounding? How to balance the tension between criticality and humanity? How to maintain the stream, the stream of equality, liberty, humanity, and dignity? As Wilbur said, a moment of emptiness presents us as an opportunity and challenge. Looking forward, the major practices are evolving. People won the district election, 
by a landslide in 2019 and look forward to the by-election and legislature, legislature election in 2020. People participate in direct election. People participate in direct action, continue to protest and support the yellow economy, meaning to boycott the pro-Beijing business and support the pro-movement business. People reimagine the potential of social movement, asking people to unionize and strike. Combining a new economy and unionization reveal emerging practices and reflection on a sustainable, local-based, low-carbon economy. Student activism had a diverse role after 2014. Some went into election, some for community organizing, some for grassroots. And many today are pushing for international advocacy, a new effort that could be seen in the creation of Laosan. The history of Hong Kong is full of tragedy because the empires and capital often collaborate, structuring and obstructing the resistance of the people. It is hard to transcend the limitation of the generation and geopolitical condition. What people are trying to do today is an ongoing effort to explore decolonial practices, overcoming the limitation of each generation and dealing with the questions of who lives, who makes decisions, what decisions, and what is the role of the ordinary people. These questions all point to the emerging practices to rethink what a progressive, sustainable resistance means to us in Hong Kong and the world. It might even require us to reflect on the internal contradiction of the left party and left politics, to rethink how the Communist Party and socialist regime become corrupted and obsessed with power and its own survival out of fear and anxiety. This is the question for the left, for the progressive, and for everyone who aspires to a future with equality, liberty, humanity, and dignity. It is our honor to present the story of our resistance to you, and it is an invitation to you to rethink together with us, Hong Kong as part of the global movement that embodies a bright future. I'm now turn the stage over to Zoe to further our thinking. Thank you everyone for being with us here tonight. Thank you so much. Thanks, Walter and Alex, for the excellent sharing, contextualizing Hong Kong in the long history of the clash of empire and grassroots resistance. So my presentation today will focus on the cross-border transnational dimension of Hong Kong social movements. I will first talk about Hong Kong's roles in activism in China, especially in the labor movements. Then I will briefly touch upon Hong Kong protests still very fast on China since June. Finally, I will transit to the global right wing's hijack of the Hong Kong issue, which is probably a flip side of the lack of left wing solidarity we observe today. So even though there has not been discernible signs of labor solidarity between ordinary Hong Kongers and Chinese workers as labor movement on both sides can be pretty weak, there's a long tradition for Hong Kong left wing parties and anti-establishment unions such as Hong Kong CTU, Neighborhood and Workers Service Center, League of Social Democrats, etc., to organize solidarity campaigns with prosecuted Chinese activists and labor movements. For instance, this picture shows various Hong Kong left-wing organizations protesting against the repression of student activists and workers involved in the J6 drug in Shenzhen back in 2018, and many activists were still missing till today. In addition, Hong Kong serves and will probably still continue to serve as a temporal haven for labor studies in China. Hong Kong labor NGOs, such as China Labor Bulletin, Worker Empowerment, SACOM, to name a few, document labor movements and working class conditions in China by releasing research reports and creating databases for working class solidarity. For example, China Labor Bulletin is a long-time Hong Kong organization promoting independent union organizing and workers' rights in China. So this picture is CLB's famous strike map visualizing thousands of labor strikes each year 
which is widely used by NGO practitioners and scholars. Additionally, there used to be a time period mainly from 1993 to 2010s when Hong Kong-based activists and scholars forced their workers resistance in China by training young activists, established uh, labor NGOs, volunteer uh, networks, especially in a region called the Pure River Delta in southern China. So 1993 was actually a crucial starting point because there was a deadly incident, the Jimmy Handicraft Factory Fire, uh, you know, the Chinese version of Triangle Factory Fire, which killed 87 female migrant workers. So this picture shows a burned factory floor. So this incident prompted the uh, Hong Kong NGOs and left-wing organizations to put more resources and attention in labor issues and resistance in China. Of course, during recent years, such cross-border collaborations met with harsh state repression, and many labor NGOs were forced to shut down, and some activists were still detained right now. But it is still important history to be remembered. Apart from these institutionalized channels, there are also many social movement media, community projects, and radical organizations that maintain close connections with mainland Chinese activists. Although I would say many such connections are not widely known outside of the social movement circle. This first picture on the left shows the former location of Autonomous AA, which is a relatively independent organization from the Hong Kong Federation of Students. It ceased operation last year, but many young Chinese activists draw inspirations from the ways to organize community activism. Uh, this second picture is a logo for a project called Monolith Movement. Uh, this name implies it provides critical analysis of social movement around the world and there's actually a separate section dedicated to social movement in China. So this last picture is another a logo for another new platform called Reignite. It offers a left-wing perspective on social movement and labor issues in the greater China. And it has been quite popular since the Hong Kong protests in June. So every social movement has its spillover effects and anti-extradition law protests are no exception. On the corporate media, perhaps the most propagated effect you see is a counter-mobilization by Chinese international students around various university campuses. Some protests were backed by the Chinese authorities and some were spontaneous, but these are only part of a story distorting the new more nuanced picture. Although not the majority, quite a few Telegram channels that I closely follow have been such supporters of Hong Kong protests from day one. There are also GitHub repositories, Facebook pages, anonymous blogs, and messaging groups help circulating various protest info. For example, this screenshot was taken from a personal blog called Program Think, which provides a detailed timeline of the protests each month. Many Chinese citizens also physically travel to the protest scene using tourist visas. Similar to what had happened during the Unrug movement in 2014, many users, Chinese users, were either warned by the authorities or directly reported by their co-workers for supporting the Hong Kong online. It is estimated that since June last year, at least 28 Chinese activists from various uh, activism fields were either detained or faced criminal charges for supporting the protest. Unfortunately, the majority of cases are not known and reported by any mass media. Despite state repression, there are already visible unintended effects on public discourses in China. So the rise of Pintong Forum constitutes one of the major spillover effects of the anti-extradition protest. Pintong is an uncensored, anonymous political forum that gained enormous popularity since the Hong Kong protests, although users in China have to use a VPN to access it. This is the front page of Pintong, and you can see Liberate Hong Kong is actually the first tab of the forum. Moreover, one of the most popular posts appearing on the uh, main page of Pintong is an anonymous solidarity campaign organized by the Chinese university students, domestic and overseas. They wrote their messages of encouragement along with a cover of their student IDs to show their support, 
which is a pretty small way to verify the student's status while keeping themselves anonymous. However, uh, it is worth noticing that such alliance mostly exists between the right wing or liberal folks on both sides and seldom occurs for radicals and leftists. There's still this uh, implicit assumption that leftists in China all support the current regime, considering CCP tend to dominate and monopolize all the leftist discourses. And only pro-US liberals and conservatives are allies of Hong Kongers. In addition, although Pintong has quite intensive interactions with Hong Kong forums, Yan Den, as users are constantly forwarding posts from other platforms, there's still little discussion about labor issues and working class solidarity on uh, platforms on both sides. The spillover effects, of course, move well beyond the Sino Hong Kong dynamics. Hong Kong protest is hijacked by the global conservatives and far right to advance their own agendas, which was also prominent during other decentralized social movements, such as the Euro Maidan in Ukraine in 2014 and the Yellow Vax movement in France last year. This first picture shows Joe Gibson from Patriot Prayer, a far right uh, craft style organization made active in the West Coast, waving a US flag near Hong Kong rally. In fact, he and his assistants physically traveled to Hong Kong in early July to live stream the movement and uploaded tons of videos about it. And then they used their Hong Kong videos to raise money for their own organization. They were also one of the earliest right-wing supporters of the movement. The repertoire of waving US flags in multiple locations in Hong Kong seemed to inspire some pro-Trump localists. Such hijacking is of course not confined to conservative in the US. For example, this Australian all right figure, Ave Yemeni, has devoted an entire YouTube video of channel to Hong Kong protests, where he selectively picks a group of misinformed Chinese diaspora to disseminate his anti-China and Islamophobia agenda. He also tends to choose localist groups over other kinds of groups for interviewees to exaggerate the existing pro-US sentiment in Hong Kong. Last month, four far-right Ukraine activists were also spotted in the uh, Hong Kong protesting, claiming they were just tourists. So apart from this offline participation, conservatives and the far-right also construct a wide range of rhetorical strategies framing Hong Kongers as allies of rising politics. This first picture appearing in a US right-wing magazine depicts a dubious coalition between Hong Kongers and Trump supporters against their common, common enemies, ultra leftists. <laughs> uh, uh, additionally, these two tweets signal a very novel approach. They are using the rhetoric of social movements against other movements by creating a false demarcation between those deserving and undeserving protesters. The former including pro-democracy Hong Kongers, while the latter are those fake anti-democracy leftists or anti-fascists. The seven tweets appearing in the official Twitter for newly established organizations called the Young American Against Socialism. Since August, almost half of YAS tweets are actually about Hong Kong and boycotting China. I don't want to overplay the right actual impacts on this movement, but these are all systematic efforts to depict Hong Kongers and, as anti-communism vanguards and natural allies of conservative agendas. Overall, it is essential for the left to recognize the existing efforts the international right have put to the movement and the ensuing feedback loop they were able to foster between the international right-wing discourse and the localist politics in Hong Kong. It is also imperative to assess our opportunities and dis uh, difficulties for critical anti-capitalist intervention. This is also probably why we hope this event today can be a platform for such constructive discussion. So this is the end of all my sharing and we still have plenty of time for uh, left. And we actually initially prepared a dialogue section between the three of us, but uh, we decided to skip it to leave more time for the Q&A.
just forcing forcing the students to remove the posters in their classrooms, you know, by their HKDSE, you know, using um, like uh, I mean, the the subject is supposed to be along. How would you rely more on them? But at the same time, they're also just students, and they don't have their the economic power, you know, to sustain themselves. So yeah. Taking some of the uh, the voice in this space and in that discussion, some of the some of these two. Sure, sure. Alex, do you sure. want to talk about the sure? Um, I I have a quick response. I think you are also very familiar with Hong Kong's situation. So I think one of the pressing challenge for students, teachers, and principals in Hong Kong right now is that whether they could like well fan off the pressure from the government in protecting principals and teachers who advocate a more liberal thinking and protecting their students who are um, went to the protest site. I think that would be the first battle. If that battle, uh, people could safeguard uh, the courageous and more liberal students and principals, then uh, that would also uh, give a lesson to the government. I think that would be really critical in the next coming months whether any principals or teachers, they will be fired by like the officials by using uh, any kind of unlawful means. And as you might also know, uh, the teachers union in Hong Kong uh, has been quite strong for decades. So uh, what strategy they would take, that would also impact uh, in what way the students could be protected and how the curriculum could be monitored with a more liberal approach uh, instead of like, well, the curriculum being revised in a more conservative way. Um, and you might also be aware that many teachers in Hong Kong, they actually are quite active and have been quite active in uh, sharing their more liberal ideas with students uh, to think. Uh, I think the, one of the challenge combining the political pressure might be whether the teachers could maintain their morale when they face political pressure. I think how to support them psychologically and socially, that would be crucial. And that would, we would need uh, more information to analyze. But I would say I share your worries and, and your concern over what has been happening in the educational sector. So uh, I personally think the uh, xenophobia sentiment in Hong Kong is greatly exaggerated, both by the uh, propaganda machine in China and also probably international media, by only uh, emphasizing those uh, nationalist discourses. And also out of concern of safety, safety a lot of left-wing uh, folks both in China and in Hong Kong, they are sometimes unwilling to say that they are actually doing some organizing on the ground. And also, uh, I think there's also the issue of, uh, there's actually a lot of left-wing elements in the movement, the building solidarity, and also there's a lot of union organizing. There are more unions established in multiple industries in Hong Kong during the past year, if you look at the statistics. and. Um, but I think the other real issue is that the left is not able to form a collective uh, political force. On the one hand, there's a lot of infighting within the left uh, community when people disagree with uh, a lot of strategies. And the, and the right seems more united. And so they are able to uh, dominate the uh, movement even though there's actually a very small percentage of them. I, I will not say there's a lot of localist uh, supporters, but they're just able to dominate the discourse and the media headlines. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. If yeah, and I think that um, we have to keep telling uh, our own story, which is that Hong Kong's freedom ultimately depends on uh, our ability to cultivate meaningful cross-border solidarity, cross-border labor solidarity. You know, the forces that are keeping Hong Kong fixed in this paradoxical 
uh, impossible situation are actually the same forces uh, that originate uh, from the mainland that are exploiting uh, migrants there, workers there, and uh, the dynamics are completely interlinked. So I think that by telling a story about political economy um, and also by uh, holding events uh, overseas where it's safe for mainlanders and um, Hong Kongers to uh, have dialogues, uh, which is something that we've been trying to do, um, are, are all different strategies that we can use to, um, to show that we really have less uh, that divides us uh, than uh, unites us. Um, and, I, and I think that um, that's going to be crucial just to um, rebut the CCP's uh, overdetermination of this idea of Chineseness with its own image um, in, in trying to pretend that the state and the party is, is uh, the sole uh, container for this idea of Chineseness. Um, you know, we really have to challenge that and, uh, you know, Hong Kong is a great place to start. Hi, and thank you for the talk. Uh, I just have a quick question. So I noticed that it's great that you know the, the tactic of the general strike or unionization is something that we didn't see before in Hong Kong. So in a lot of sense, class struggle tactics is being brought to the fore, but it's not actually being translated into demand. Um, and in fact, I noticed that with the being, being stuck to divide like purely democratic demand. I wonder how you reconcile that as electives overseas especially as we look at um, how do we balance the idea of greater good when you said the power to represent the movement across international... Um yeah. Um, I can say a few words and then... Yeah, so uh, I think um, Alex actually touched on this near the end of his talk uh, with the different avenues that the, you know, the four characters are, are um, pursuing um, moving forward. And one of them is definitely unionizing. To actually um, uh, tap into this long tradition of uh, strikes and unions in Hong Kong, and it's definitely difficult. It's not something that you can just snap your fingers and say, "All right, everyone, you know, let's do this." But um, the relationships are being hashed out on the ground. The you know the inner uh, group po politics are you know are kind of trying to fall into place right now, and the infrastructure is being created, which is also really difficult. I mean, do you have a strike fund? Do you how do you organize it? Um, you know who uh, you know protects the collective, and um, you know. So we definitely have our eye on that, and we're we're looking forward to you know um, writing about it um, on Laosan and, and other places. Um, I think you had uh, you also asked about um, just like <clears throat> like talking more about the social and economic demand, uh, you know aspects of Hong Kong. And I think that that is um, happening more in Chinese, actually. Um, when you read about it in English, uh, you don't see a lot of that. I mean, it's really ironic that one of the best places to read about the material conditions in Hong Kong is actually financial news, like right wing, kind of, you know, like Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, that kind of stuff, because <clears throat> they actually, uh, you know, analyze Hong Kong in terms of capitalism, you know? instead of talking about it in terms of, you know, freedom and uh, kind of these liberal ideas that get tossed around. Um, but uh, in local discourse, there is a lot of conversation. And I think that the 2020 LegCo elections will actually be a huge opportunity to actually talk about housing again, and talk about, you know, infrastructure and, 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 you know, migrant labor and these different things. Um, I think right now, um, even leftists that we talk to in Hong Kong, um, tell us that the movement and police brutality is just so, just really fills up all the space for discourse and it's very hard to break through and kind of talk about these more uh, long-term structural things. But I do think the movement, and um, maybe I'll, do you have And the whole movement sometimes get into a process of gamification where everyone is kind of like anonymous agent in the game and trying to finish a daily task instead of uh, doing more serious uh, discussion. But uh, as was said, that uh, this kind of enthusiasm will uh, disappear in the end, and people will likely be forced into really serious discussion in the future. Um, uh, I, th I think it would also help uh, if you could elaborate a bit uh, on like, what do you mean by social demand? What specific social demands are you referring to? Because maybe, maybe they have been mentioned by uh, some folks in Hong Kong, but I'm not sure like what specific uh, that in, in, in mind of you. Yeah, I mean like for example housing, right? Um, and in fact I think the CCP demagogically takes out first by pretending to criticize these Hong Kong typhoons, real escape typhoons. But the similar criticism doesn't have, at least not the stuff that I've seen, has like enough like that comes from within the movement, even though a lot of us know that a lot of that condition creates 
many Hong Kong people, uh, when it comes to strategy, they would say, uh, without democracy or like political reform, you could not really change any social policy. And the call for more public housing, how to use land, uh, how to plan uh, the, the areas in Hong Kong, they have always been about uh, more public and social housing, more affordable housing. Uh, that would be their response. Uh, I, I, I hope that helps. Yeah. Um, Bianni, if you want to respond to also the question about what does it mean to be a leftist here? Yeah, I think that is also a very interesting question. Um, I mean, uh, personally, you know, I really, um, I like to say that my leftism was forged in Hong Kong. Um, I mean, I was really more of a liberal before I started living in Hong Kong, and it was through understanding the way that, um, you know, uh, global capitalism could be read through a space like Hong Kong, um, seeing the way that white supremacy could be articulated uh, in a space like Hong Kong, um, seeing, uh, you know, all these things that, you know, policing, all these, uh, you know, uh, border logics um, that we talk about in the U.S. also appearing in Hong Kong in these very disturbing ways. Um, and, uh, you know, emphasize to me um, not only just that these problems are global in nature, but also that there are these forms of resistance that are happening in Hong Kong that didn't occur to, you know, me when I was living in the U.S. before I moved to Hong Kong and don't occur to a lot of us folks in the West um, day to day. So, um, I think that's what motivates me to talk about Hong Kong, um, you know, to an audience like this one as well, because I think that, um, you know, again, taking Hong Kong as a starting point um, means that we have to trouble a lot of these uh, um, concepts that um, don't get troubled often enough um, in, in Western discourse. And, and, you know, by that, I mean, uh, what does it mean to uh, launch this critique from a non-sovereign place, you know? What does it mean to talk about post-coloniality when you, you know, uh, all the dynamics that we <laughs> described earlier? Um, but I think there's a different question as well, which is just, um, you know, uh, what what is our goal, right? Like, it, like when we're sort of um, trying to, um, uh, you, you know, uh, give a call to action. You know, what is that call to action? Um, and 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 I think that. Um, you know, uh, awareness is really uh, as far as much as we can hope for. Um, I don't really know that we can, um, you know, uh, w I don't know that we should be saying call your congressperson and doing that kind of thing because um, the, the goal is not to use, you know, um, to, to use empire in, you know, um, in our efforts to try to help people in Hong Kong um, because that would actually uh, defeat the entire purpose, right? Um, Really, it's about uh, trying to figure out if we can articulate forms of transnational solidarity um, that don't play into those dynamics. And I think that, unfortunately, uh, our survival, you know, in Hong Kong depends on that. Um, because if we do stay within these nation-state categories and kind of say, well, I can't really um, do anything about this because I'm over here, or because I speak a certain language or whatnot, then it's actually just going to exacerbate a lot of these divisions um, over time, in, in, in my view. Um, so, uh, the, the, yeah, um, I think the, the fact that this is a difficult question to answer is exactly why um, uh, we, we should be doing this and thinking through it. Uh, I, I could address another question for you about um, why there's like no appeal to magic in China. Uh, the first question that would come up would be like how, uh, how to be addressed and, and what to address. Uh, because like, people would face challenges on what channels and infrastructures do they have to reach like their mainland counterpart in mainland China. Could they use Facebook? No. Could they use Twitter? No. Then what channels could they disseminate information when technology, digital technology and social media play a critical role in disseminating information. And you could, you could imagine like well, people in China and elsewhere, they use a very different platform. Uh, so the only viable platform to communicate like between like progressive Hong Kongers and mainland Chinese, you only have very limited options. And uh, uh, so you sold some of the channels to us, but you could only reach a very limited number of people. 
And I think this is a real challenge, uh, a really hard one. How do you really circulate information uh, and share information to people who don't actually go into the platform that you see and collect information? Um, it is one of the challenges, I will admit that. And I think that is also an interesting challenge because uh, it would be the reality uh, facing us in, in the coming decades, and, and that is the reality. How to think about it, and how to think about like uh, how could we do effective communication as people who want a more progressive, open-minded, brighter society. The left actually has to think about how to deliver a message effectively, and that concerns uh, all the ground organizing and also digital campaigning. Or that are come from a place of deep despair and deep trauma. So my question is, how do we channel that trauma into collectively into a force that is good, that is for liberation and for justice, and not, you know, to dominate other people? And how do we keep that sustainable? I have kind of three questions. The first one is, um, when you recall the uh, evolution of Hong Kong, um, neither of you actually talked too much about the feeding of the colonial opium wars, and that the 25% of Britain's economy was supported by opium, that the largest foundational uh, wealth in America was created by opium, all fell to the Chinese. And I think that has a lot of a profound effect on how that particular city evolved, is how it was used. Okay, the second thing is like, uh, there was a French economist named Louis Gavet who once posed a question to a room full of uh, Westerners, a lot, okay, and asked, what was the last time you heard something good about mainland China? And nobody could raise their hand, but the Western press had been pressing a particular narrative. So I was kind of curious, it's like, as we move forward, like, there seems to be this cultural You know, the, the confusion we're having now between these two titanic economies with these huge militaries and with these huge populations, how are we doing to like, really bridge real cultural uh, uh, conversations where we can actually progress beyond the, the, these types of, of internal problems that we're experiencing? While it used to be a tool that was introduced to Hong Kong by the West as a way of introducing democracy and liberty values to Hong Kong, right now it's more, I, I, I read it more as like um, capitalism as a way to like erode these values and through, for example, um, the sacking of employees of these businesses for expressing their views. Um, I'm just wondering um, how invasive is ideas of capitalism um, to to um, Hong Kong, but the values these values in Hong Kong, and also kind of also um, as as defined by uh, Alex, um, these ways of like direct actions, for example, like renovation, um, are they kind of um, effective ways? I, I, I try to provide 
um, some of my thinking uh, on the question of trauma. Um, I think that part, to my mind, also concerned about the question about like how could we uh, present a more positive image or history of the past. I, I see it as the same thing. It is uh, my feeling is that like my question, like my question to that question is that how could we rewrite a history that makes people understand the complexity of history while not losing the critical perspective on what has happened. I think that is really challenging. And I would say for most of the time, uh, we might end up doing a bad job in being really critical, but losing the humanity or destroying other dignity by displacing what are concerned by others who are also humans. Uh, I think that's one of the challenge uh, facing the left. It is like the left has a lot of theoretical and critical tools in unearthing the so-called root cause of what caused our suffering. But in the process of like our analyzing stuff, we usually uh, lose the awareness of being humane to others, uh, forget to ask, uh, forgetting to ask the question of like why people end up advocating this or that that you really hate or make you disgust. I think that is one of the critical questions to me. And I do see lots of this kind of conversation happening uh, everywhere in the States and also in Hong Kong. And I think that would be a dilemma. We don't have like a canned answer because sometimes we will feel like we need some sort of moral arguments to reject those uh, uh, right wing leaning sentiment. Uh, but the question would come this way. Uh, how do we respond to those intense emotion? How do we traverse it? And what would be an effective critique? I think that is something the left as a whole have been exploring and reflecting because we have seen a lot of critical tools used in analyzing stuff actually result in uh, the, lo the, loss, the loss of credibility of the left. And that is a question I think like we all share and how we could like deal with this kind of challenge. I think that is one of the real challenge we have to rethink. And that concerns like ourselves on an individual level, how we as a collective think about strategy and how we could strategize on like organizing work, uh, campaign for electoral politics, direct action, and even thinking about alternative to capitalism. Because I think that is one of the questions uh, coming up earlier on, are there any discussion on Marx, Marxism? I'm not sure like well the exact meaning, but that question is interesting uh, because like we as Hong Kongers, I think that question is particularly interesting when people in Hong Kong talk about Marxism, they would refer like the, the, the phrase would make them uh, think about what, ha what has happened in China. And it was usually property. It was usually how the people in Hong Kong trying to send stuff uh, across the Hong Kong-China border. And the question, I think the real question is, uh, what has happened in the different economic transition and what works and what doesn't as for a socialist economy and what kind of alternative economic taxes do we have right now? I think that is some question we are all struggling. Uh, and I would say I, I'm really interested in this question because I, I think that really cut across many of the issues, but how do you like, well, uh, prefigure or uh, cultivate an initiative that works from a, a, a community scale to a more larger scale, that would be one of the challenge. Uh, I would say that is also one of my research interests, and that's why like, I'm researching on different ideas on how people rethink economy. What does economy mean? And I hope that kind of link the questions together because I think it through this way. Uh, and, uh, and I really look forward to like, how you like, uh, uh, think about uh, what I've just said. And I think there are a lot of limitations, but it is interesting to see like, how the conversation could continue. Uh, people from others' political spectrums. 
Uh, but yeah, this is simply ha happening in a lot of uh, different countries, I guess. And uh, I think uh, the feasible strategy, personally, uh, for me and a few fr activist friends, is to think about the feasible things that we still can do uh, at this stage and to set small goals every day and to uh, if we think about the uh, uh, Hong Kong protests and for example across uh, for the dynamic be between the uh, mainlanders and Hong Kongers uh, there are still a lot of things that we can uh, think about in fostering uh, solidarity in communities that uh, I mentioned foreign of Ping Tong, uh, which uh, there's a lot of information exchange, but there's also a lack of working class solidarity. I think a major issue is that the working class really lack enough time and energy to engage in politics, so they are generally excluded in the debate. The kind of mainlanders and Hong Kongers that you will see that have uh, this kind of cross border uh, like sentiments uh, or tendency tend to be like middle class or that they have these resources to be exposed to a wide range of information and they have the knowledge and to articulate the situation. I personally don't think uh, the working class on both sides, they don't have the tendency to build solidarity. On the one hand, they don't have time. On the other hand, even if they have the, uh, they have the awareness, sometimes they don't articulate it. They, they don't think it is solidarity, although they're actually doing it. For example, I'm personally doing research on uh, digital laborers in China, the workers in the video game industry, for example, and if you ask them, directly ask them whether or not they have experience on exploitation, they will say no, but if you have more intense interaction with them, you, you realize that they actually have a very intense understanding about their life situations. You just need to have spend more time with them and trying to have a, a more deep uh, conversation with them, although they don't have the vocabulary to articulate their situation. So I, I think the left still have a long way to go. We, we still have a lot of things that we can do at this stage. Yeah, and I'll try and just say a quick thing. I also really appreciate the question about trauma, and I do think it cuts across a lot of what people are bringing up. I mean, um, when I, uh, uh, you know, speak to um, friends from mainland China, you know, uh, often we have to have this conversation before we can really start talking about uh, the substantive things that maybe I want to talk about, you know, like maybe it's not actually, maybe the first thing isn't about political economy, maybe it is about thinking through, you know, our starting points, our historical starting points. Um, you know, I remember as an undergrad reading Chinese history and, um, you know, reading the part about the humiliation of China in the 1800s, I mean, that, that hit me on like a, on some kind of level. And so I understand um, the fact that that is a powerful force for a lot of folks who are looking at what's happening in Hong Kong and being reminded of that in perhaps distorted ways, but it's there nonetheless and we have to work through it. I mean, for Hong Kongers, I mean, that, that moment is uh, 1989, I think. And I think the really valuable thing that I got out of Alex's presentation is it was really a map of the different generational traumas that were happening in, uh, throughout Hong Kong's history and how people were struggling to respond and came up with these incomplete responses that then carried over into the next, uh, you know, the next generational battle. Um, and even thinking through how uh, 2019 is so affected by the traumas that came out of the umbrella movement that were never resolved. Um, and, you know, I think that that is, um, so, you know, there's these questions of like, what do we do, right? And I think that one of the uh, things is just to have this full historical awareness um, so that we can understand these patterns that keep happening in our efforts to try to respond in these incomplete ways um, so that we don't uh, keep repeating the same kind of uh, dynamics. Um, and it's not just analyzing what's happening within Hong Kong and these generations, but also the larger, you know, context of geopolitics and ideological movements and everything. But, you know, um, and I think the powerful thing maybe is that at least in 2019, there does seem to be a awareness that something from the last generation had to be overcome. And that's why you saw these sort of four, uh, you know, tendencies temporarily calling a truce. And of course, 
we're also now talking about the problems with that, right? And, and the problems of that in not sufficiently countering right-wing ideologies or getting co-opted and so on. And we'll have to respond to that in the next generation. But I think that feelings are a very good starting point uh, for talking about these things uh, because that is actually how these praxis get shaped and um, you know transmuted uh, through time. Um, maybe last round of questions, and then conversation can continue. I assume that there needs to be some sort of leverage from one side, and given the, the size and amount of resources of you know, the position Hong Kong has been stuck between you know, the US and China, which have a massive amount of resources, what if this uh, type of leverage that Hong Kongers have? Because um, it primarily seems to be economic uh, disruption. Is there, are there other things that Hi, um, I just wanted to first of all say I really enjoyed the talk. I'm also really enjoying the questions, which are probably great. I'm having a great time right now. Um, my question is really, um, I'm glad that Hong Kong is um, involved as a node in the opium trade as mentioned, because of course this isn't just any city that we're talking about, right? Like when it comes to neoliberalism and when it comes to a lot of these things, Hong Kong has a unique colonial history. Um, and I'm wondering, first of all, um, if we can talk about how that impacts the nature of the, how neoliberalism takes place there, um, particularly when it comes to financial speculation, and particularly when it comes to like a degree of this activity anyway, because it's foundational to the very city itself. to ask more technical questions because of my approach of uh, how to solve the visible violence of police brutality and the visible violence of the uh, department of justice. They are just putting, um, like, the police randomly, randomly arrest anyone and the department of justice uh, uh, just without any, without any concrete uh, evidence which put every people in the court. And then on the, at the same time, no police and, and other side of the people are putting in the court. And then if the, if the brutality of police, they, they can be substituted by the invalence, uh, in, in visible violence of the Department of Justice. Then I, I don't go of this quick question. I see no, no, no way out. I see no internal resources that Hong Kong can solve the problem by, by themselves. Even, even the judiciary system, they, they, the, the judges, they are still very confident on themselves. They can, they can judge that thing happening in Hong Kong. But no, Terry Lemon is not going to do this. CCC is not going to do this. Because they rely on the police force. And then I, I'm really concerned about this because it's like one more girl being raped is too much. One, one more teenager being, being beaten and being put in jail is too much. And then now it's like, it's so unfair that the people that they are, they're detained for more than 100, 180 days, a half year, just because the Department of Justice is not, not going to co cooperate with the, with, the, with the court to get the evidence. So it's just, they, they are trying to do all the dirty, dirty, dirty tricks to, to destroy the whole generation of our next generation. I'm really angry about that, and I don't think Hong Kong has internal resources for that. And I, I because of this, I really study about how the uh, how the Germany they, they do the police reform after the whole pro Nazi uh, era and then even even Germany they didn't do well they didn't do well because they don't have enough men so they so <laughs> after war so they didn't so mo most of the most of the in the police in the police force in the capital and only a few um, big boss being executed and most men just migrate out of migrate to US and enjoy their enjoy their uh, political life uh, retirement. 
and then most of the most of the people who really uh, participate in the violence they remain in the police force. And this I, I think this cannot be accepted for, for Hong Kong people. I cannot accept that anyone who rape and they have no consequences, they just take basketball and then they can they can still receive our money and get retirement. So I, I really want to ask because Germany they didn't they didn't see it. Uh, with the internal, with, with internal force, it's by allies, it's by UK and the pressure from US. So how how you think about this situation of how we can use international awareness, international force to help this at this moment, not 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 waiting until all our generation being this being destroyed. of impact harm and the long-term reform strategy. I think what you said, like uh, asking the international community to apply pressure to the government, that is one way. Uh, the question is, uh, the question to, my, to me is like whether we have other options and strategies combining together to make the strategy more effective. I would say I do not have any immediate solution, but I've been seeing some people like Lausanne uh, what they have been trying to do is to get or garner resources from the states. They, I think a few weeks back then, they tried to uh, have an online conference with folks, activists, emerging from uh, Black Lives Matter. And they are also thinking, discussing with some of the activists in Hong Kong on how do you do with police brutality. Uh, if, if some folks from Lausanne could speak to that, I think that would also be helpful. I think that question, we should, uh, we could also address it after the Q&A section, because I feel like we won't be able to address your deep concern right now. But I will see what they have been doing is also one strategy, because we can see that right now, uh, on an international level, you have many US politicians or uh, right-wing key opinion leaders saying, uh, criticizing the Hong Kong and Chinese government, but we rarely see uh, enough uh, uh, left-leaning voices uh, from the U.S. and elsewhere to rethink with Hong Kong activists uh, talking about police brutality and other issues. And for many of the U.S. left, they usually see police brutality deeply connected with economic issues and racism. And that is also an issue in Hong Kong. And if you see in that light, my my, my feeling is that how we could connect the local activists in Hong Kong, the mainstream Han Chinese or Hong Kongers with the ethnic minorities, because it has also been a huge issue for a lot of ethnic minority in Hong Kong. And they have always been a victim of the police system in Hong Kong. It is not something new. It has been there for decades. But it is new that we see a lot of uh, yellow faces, uh, Hong Kong kids, being beaten up by police. And I think that, like what both uh, ethnic people being beaten up by police, you actually share the same recalls about like well, the role of police in maintaining social orders in Hong Kong. And, and if you look at the criminal justice system in Hong Kong, you actually have the police arrest the people, send them to court, and the court will usually give a heavy sentencing and send them to prison. And that is usually, that is like the ordinary life for most of the Hong Kong people who live uh, on the margin of society in Hong Kong. When I was in the prison, many prisoners actually said that they hated the police. 
And actually, many of the people ending up in, in the prison, they are young folks uh, who like, uh, were drug dealers, or uh, they were members of gangsters. They were betrayed uh, by their leaders, and the police simply arrested them. And they were the one who ended up being in the prison for months and years. And if you see that in that light, then I would see we actually have a lot of allies in Hong Kong. I know we have a lot of people right now in Hong Kong, but if we want to unite more people, I would say we actually have a, a lot, way more arguments to convince others to fight this battle. And I think that is crucial. Uh, but the question would come this way, how we could really speak to the interests of people from of different stakeholders, uh, how they would join the battle. I think that is another strategic challenge we have to think about because you could appeal to middle class. We have been doing that, but how we could appeal to like our people across class and racial spectrum, that would be another issue. I think to deal with police brutality, my short answer would be we have to work at different level on different scale because I do not see one single solution. And I think I share a sentiment on thinking we could only by like dealing or eliminating, eliminating police brutality by working on every strategies and option we have. And that is the only hope. And I also think that is the hope what uh, give energy to Hong Kong people right now. Because we, we all do not know like what works and what don't. And we can only try our best. I think like by being here with folk here uh, tonight, it is also an attempt uh, to let you know what we have been facing. There are many challenges like police brutality. And we alone, we could not deal with them. I know like people in the US, they also have been like facing these challenges for decades. And I think that is another similar strategic goal that we could explore. And that is pressing. As you realize, there are many people beaten up by police. And you also hear a lot of news on people, protesters being raped by police. How could we protect them? How could we intervene immediately? I think that is one of the pressing questions for all of us. Um, and I think that sometimes it might be a dilemma. Like for some folks, some Western left, they would say when the right wing people are intervening in Hong Kong, Hong Kong protest is simply about violence. So we, the left, would not intervene. But if the left did not intervene, what happened and what are the potential power? I think it's like Sony has touched upon that, and that is another real issue facing every of us in this room. Um, I think this is like my, my very limited understanding of like what we could do and what we have been doing right now. And we indeed need more resources, intellectual resources, material resources, manpower, uh, to like construct more narrative and more initiative in stopping the police, ha like the brutality and violence happening in Hong Kong. That is my, like some of my thoughts concerning police brutality. Um,
how that actually works and uh, understand that to reject them, we also have to go further and reject the entire system that you know constituted them. And um, yeah. Yeah, I, I just want to like add something to what uh, Wilbur has just said. I think you are right. Like uh, on the observation on the open war, the colonialism have a huge impact in shaping the middle class in Hong Kong. And um, we have like very limited uh, scholarship and uh, analysis on that part. But from like what people have been researching and discovering, they would trace like the rise of the middle class in Hong Kong uh, back to the colonial period when the British uh, took over Hong Kong, they need uh, elites to collaborate just like they did elsewhere in India, uh, Africa, uh, and some of the business people in Hong Kong and some of the people who were able to speak uh, some sort of English, they actually became the partners of the British colonial regime. And after the Second World War, uh, some of them uh, got the chance uh, especially those elites who got a lot of uh, uh, cultural and social resources. They entered the institution, and many of them were also protected and guaranteed interest, uh, investment opportunity during the 80s and 90s, when the British and the Chinese government negotiated. One example would be the land policy. When the two governments like, negotiated, uh, the Chinese government actually requested the British government to change its land policy, limiting uh, the amount of land to be sold every year to 50 hectares. And that means only land developers would be able to acquire lands because they have the capital. And when they have, when they have the capital, they could actually sell their property in a higher price. And that's when they become like the major land developers and dominate nearly every retail stores in Hong Kong from like restaurants to energy, uh, electricity, uh, to like transportation, like people could actually see their presence in Hong Kong. And that might like uh, tie it back to the question on re uh, renovation. Uh, Zhang Sao, uh, I think it is hard to tell whether it is an effective strategy, but I think uh, it has some sort of um, analytical or uh, reflective meaning for people to start to rethink what economy means to Hong Kong people and how the economy takes shape in Hong Kong and how the economy was dominated by tycoons like we just mentioned. And I think that would be a starting point for people to rethink. And that is also the potential to rethink what a sustainable and low carbon economy would be like. And that would be the, like, the chances for people to throw in Marxist analysis and how to rethink an economy that really does good to people. So I think like they actually open up a lot of avenues for people to think as of an intellectual and material or activist initiative in that regard. Passing around a sign-up sheet. Did everyone uh, get the clipboard at some point? Um, so you will be added to, um, you know, our, our newsletter, and we can definitely uh, keep you updated on opportunities to, um, you know, uh, volunteer or, or contribute or, or just, you know, have more opportunities for discussion. So um, yeah. Uh, I, I don't think we have the kind of infrastructure to kind of. Yeah. So, but we'll if, we'll think about something, and then you know we'll have your contacts, um, so we'll be able to uh, talk about that. Mm -hmm. Any final comment on leverage or neoliberalism or yeah, any of the ideas that are tossed around?
think by being here, by being here today, is really for what leverage we have with you. I think like if you see us as partners, and if we are partners, then I think what we have is our leverage. I think that is really true, because uh, from Wilbur's presentation and Zoe's presentation and a bit of my sharing, perhaps we also have like a sense of like people are exploring alternatives. Like besides siding with the empires, what option do they have? And how could they build allies that are re reliable, innovative, and more sustainable? I think uh, that is like the, the hopeful answer we wish to share. In reality, I would say it is always very gloomy. And that's why you see people feel like they have very limited options. And like, it is true as for the question of police brutality. And that's why like, you see people being very desperate, exploring every option they could, whenever the opportunities are presented to them, because they really have very limited options. And the limited option also like structure or impact people's emotion in seeing reality. And that's why it is not rare in the past seven, eight months, many youngsters in Hong Kong actually took their life because they do not see hope. And many of them, they will have a suicide card or not in their backpack when they go on the protest because they felt really desperate. And maybe you also could sense the feeling by hearing what we present you, the history of Hong Kong. And that, I would say that is a very tragic one. And you can see a lot of tragedy. And this is without doubt, that's why many people in Hong Kong would see things, feel things in this way. And I would say this is how many people in Hong Kong perceive leverage. And people want allies, they need allies. They're also trying hard to build allies. And how those potential allies respond to the struggle in Hong Kong, that will also shape the future trajectory. Because it is always like two ways or multiple ways and the dynamic is complex. And I think Lao San as a group, a collective, is also trying to provide support, uh, to provide ways for folks in the States to understand Hong Kong and to bridge folks in the States with folks in Hong Kong, to see how a more progressive movement could be imagined in the coming half. Yeah, and I think that that imagination is very practical work and you know, it's not something that's uh, you know, fluffy or, or, or unreal. It's, it's really the work that we're all here to do. And, you know, something that I like to uh, remind myself when I am feeling kind of, uh, you know, despair or like we don't have any leverage is that a lot of these systems that we're up against actually are built upon very unsustainable logics. Um, I mean, if you're a leftist, <laughs> then you believe I, I think that capitalism, you know, is not sustainable, that it is going to eat itself. And I saw it eating itself in Hong Kong, and we see it um, doing the same over here. And, you know, it's the same can be said for this world system that was set up in the 20th century. The same could be said for, you know, nationalism and, and these identity politics that are creating all these uh, forms of hatred. Uh, they are built on a kind of uh, short-sightedness and a uh, misunderstanding of uh, what's actually in front of us, right? So I think that as long as we can tell a better story and we can uh, link what we're experiencing, you know, uh, through being in Hong Kong uh, to what pe people are experiencing elsewhere, um, then we have a chance of actually, um, um, you know, uh, showing um, that the world as it is uh, can't uh, go on as it is um, and that we need to um, think of a better way. So I think that's what we mean when we talk about um, Hong Kong is a starting point, but you could really take a lot of places as your starting point. Um, and maybe that's a good note to uh, yeah. end the discussion. Yeah. 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 Yeah.